Welcome to the Dread Familiar. Many people say, who's my doppelganger? When maybe they should ask, whose doppelganger am I? Carson Sestuli. Thanks to everyone listening tonight. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and leave a rating if you have a chance. A uh, special thanks to everyone who's contributed to this show so far, and if you would like to hear your story read, or would like to read a story, or would like to read your own story, send it all to submissions at thedreadfamiliar.com. Tonight's episode is, unfortunately, a little shorter than usual, simply because I didn't have a second story ready in time, and I didn't want to sacrifice quality for quantity. So the tale you're about to hear is the second half, being parts three and four of the story of William Wilson, written by Edgar Allan Poe. If you have yet to hear the first half, go back and listen to the previous episode. So without further ado, this is William Wilson. Part three. You will remember that in the last part of my story, I told of my experiences in my first school. I spoke of my early meetings with a boy who looked and behaved as I did, whose name was even the same as mine, William Wilson. I told of the night when I went to Wilson's room with a plan to hurt him. What I saw that night so frightened me that I left the room and the school forever. As I stood looking down at his sleeping form and face, I might have been looking at myself in a looking glass. It was not like this, surely not like this, that he appeared in the daytime. The same name, the same face, the same body, the same day of coming to school. And then his use of my way of walking, my manner of speaking. Was it in truth humanly possible that what I now saw was the result, and the result only, of his continued efforts to be like me? Afraid, I left the school and never entered it again. After some months at home, doing nothing, I went to study at the famous school called Eton. I had partly forgotten my days at the other school, or at least my feelings about those days had changed. The truth, the terrible truth, of what had happened there was gone. Now I doubted what I remembered. Now I called the subject into my mind only to smile at the strength of the strange ideas and thoughts I had once had. My life at Eton did not change this view. The fool's life into which I carelessly threw myself washed away everything that was valuable in my past. I do not wish, however, to tell here the story of my wrongdoing. Wrongdoing which went against every law of the school and escaped the watchful eye of all the teachers. Three years of this had passed, and I had grown much larger in body and smaller in soul. Three years of wrongdoing had made me evil. One night, I asked a group of friends who were as evil as I to come to a secret meeting in my room. We met at a late hour. There was strong drink, and there were games of cards and loud talking until the new day began appearing in the east. Warm with the wine and with the games of chance, I was raising my glass to drink in honor of some especially evil idea. When I heard the voice of a servant outside the room, he said that someone had asked to speak with me in another room. I was delighted. A few steps brought me into the hall of the building. In this room, no light was hanging, but I could see the form of a young man about my own height, wearing clothes like those I myself was wearing. His face I could not see. When I had entered, he came quickly up to me, and, taking me by the arm, he said softly into my ear, William Wilson. There was something in the manner of the stranger, and in the trembling of his uplifted finger which made my eyes open wide. But it was not this which had so strongly touched my mind and heart. It was the sound of those two simple, well-known words, William Wilson, which reached into my soul. Before I could think again and speak, he was gone. For some weeks I thought about this happening. Who and what was this Wilson, 
Where did he come from? And what were his purposes? I learned that for family reasons he had suddenly left the other school on the afternoon of the day I myself had left it. But in a short time I stopped thinking about the subject. I gave all my thought to plans for study at Oxford University. There I soon went. My father and mother sent me enough money to live like the sons of the richest families in England. Now my nature showed itself with double force. I threw aside all honor. Among those who spent too much money, I spent more. And I added new forms of wrongdoing to the older ones already well known at the university. And I fell still lower. Although it may not be easily believed, it is a fact that I forgot my position as a gentleman. I learned and used all the evil ways of those men who live by playing cards. Like such skilled gamblers, I played to make money. My friends trusted me, however. To them I was the laughing but honorable William Wilson, who freely gave gifts to anyone and everyone, who was young and who had some strange ideas but who never did anything really bad. For two years I was successful in this way. Then a young man came to the university, a young man named Glendinning, who people said had quickly and easily become very rich. I soon found him of weak mind. This, of course, made it easy for me to get his money by playing cards. I played with him often. At first, with the gambler's usual skill, I let him take money from me. Then my plans were ready. I met him one night in the room of another friend, Mr. Preston. A group of eight or ten persons were there. By my careful planning, I made it seem that it was chance that started us playing cards. In fact, it was Glendinning himself who first spoke of a card game. We sat and played far into the night, and at last the others stopped playing. Glendinning and I played by ourselves while the others watched. The game was the one I liked best, a game called Ecarte. Glendinning played with a wild nervousness that I could not understand, though it was caused partly, I thought, by all the wine he had been drinking. In a very short time, he had lost a great amount of money to me. Now he wanted to double the amount for which we played. This was as I had planned, but I made it seem that I did not want to agree. At last, I said yes. In an hour, he had lost four times as much money as before. For some reason, his face had become white. I had thought him so rich that losing money would not trouble him, and I believed this whiteness, this paleness, was the result of drinking too much wine. Now, fearing what my friends might say about me, I was about to stop the game when his broken cry and the wild look in his eyes made me understand that he had lost everything he owned. Weak of mind and made weaker by wine, he should never have been allowed to play that night. But I had not stopped him. I had used his condition to destroy him. The room was very quiet. I could feel the icy coldness in my friends. What I would have done, I cannot say, for at that moment the wide, heavy doors of the room were suddenly opened. Every light in the room went out, but I had seen that a man had entered. He was about my own height. He was wearing a very fine, long coat. The darkness, however, was now complete, and we could only feel that he was standing among us. Then we heard his voice, in a soft, low, never-to-be-forgotten voice, which I felt deep in my bones. He said, Gentlemen, I am here only to do my duty. You cannot know the true character of the man who has tonight taken a large amount of money from Mr. Glendinning. Please have him take off his coat, and then look in it very carefully. While he was speaking, there was not another sound in the room, and as he ended, he was gone. Part 4 As I ended the last part of my story, I was speaking of that terrible evening when I played cards with a young gentleman called Glendinning. We were in the rooms of one of my friends at Oxford University. I had just realized that the young man, weak of mind and weakened by wine, 
had allowed me to win from him everything he owned. I was still trying to decide what I should do when, as I said, the wide heavy doors of the room were suddenly opened. Every light in the room went out, but I had seen that a stranger had entered. He was about my own height and he was wearing a very fine long coat. The darkness, however, was now complete and we could only feel that he was standing among us. Then we heard him speak. In a soft, low, and never-to-be-forgotten voice, which I felt deep in my heart, he said, Gentlemen, I am only here to do my duty. You cannot know the true character of the man who has tonight taken a large amount of money from Mr. Glenn Dinning. Please have him take off his coat, and then look in it very carefully. While he was speaking, there was not another sound in the room. As he ended, he was gone. Can I, shall I, tell what I felt? Need I say that I was afraid? That I felt the sick fear of those who are judged forever wrong? Many hands held me, lights were brought. My friends looked in my coat. In it, they found all the high cards, the valuable cards needed to win in the game we had been playing. Secretly using these cards, I could have taken the money of anyone who played the game with me. Mr. Preston, in whose rooms we were, then said, Mr. Wilson, this is yours. He lifted from the floor a fine warm coat and said, We shall not look in this to prove again what we have proved already. We have seen enough. You will understand, I hope, the need for you to leave the university. At the very least, you must leave my room and leave it now. Down in the dust, though my spirit was, I might have tried to strike him for those words if at that moment I had not noticed something very surprising. My coat had cost more money than most men could spend, and it had been made especially for me. It was different, I thought, from every other coat in the world. When, therefore, Mr. Preston gave me the coat which he had picked up from the floor, I saw with terror that my own was already hanging on my arm. I remembered that the strange being who had so mysteriously entered and left the room had had a coat. No one else in the group had been wearing one. I placed the coat offered by Preston over my own and left his room. The next morning I began a hurried journey away from Oxford University. I ran, but I could not escape. I went from city to city, and in each one Wilson appeared. Paris, Rome, Vienna, Berlin, Moscow. He followed me everywhere. Years passed. I went to the very ends of the earth. I ran in fear as if running from a terrible sickness, and still he followed. Again and again I asked myself, who is he? Where did he come from? And what is his purpose? but no answer was found. And then I looked with the greatest care at the methods of his watch over me. I learned little. It was noticeable indeed that when he appeared now, it was only to stop me in those actions from which evil might result. But what right did he have to try to control me? I also noticed that although he always wore clothes the same as mine, he no longer let me see his face. Did he think I would not know him? He destroyed my honor at Oxford. He stopped me in my plans for getting a high position in Rome, in my love in Naples, in what he called my desire for too much money in Egypt. Did he think I could fail to see that he was the William Wilson of my schoolboy days, the hated and feared William Wilson? But let me hurry to the last scene in my story. Until now, I had tried not to strike back. He was honorable and wise. He could be everywhere, and he knew everything. I felt such wonder and fear of him that I believed myself to be weak and helpless. Though it made me angry, I had done as he desired. But now I wanted more and more to escape his control. As I began to grow stronger, it seemed to me that he began to grow weaker. I felt a burning hope. In my deepest thoughts, I decided that I was going to be free. It was at Rome during the Carnival of 1835 
that I went to a dance in the great house of Duke de Broglio. He had been drinking more wine than is usual, and the room seemed very crowded and hot. I became angry as I pushed through the people. I was looking, let me not say why, I was looking for the young, the laughing, the beautiful wife of old de Broglio. Suddenly I saw her, but as I was trying to get through the crowd to join her, I felt a hand placed upon my shoulder and that ever-remembered quiet voice within my ear. In a wild anger, I took him in a strong hold. Wilson was dressed as I had expected, like myself, in a rich coat of blue. Around his body was a band of red cloth from which hung a long, sharp sword. A mask of black cloth completely covered his face. You again, I cried, my anger growing hotter with each word. Always you again. You shall not. You shall not hunt me like this until I die. Come with me now or I will kill you where you stand. I pulled him after me into a small room nearby. I threw him against the wall and closed the door. I commanded him to take his sword in his hand. After a moment, he took it and stood waiting, ready to fight. The fight was short indeed. I was wild with hate and anger. In my arm, I felt the strength of a thousand men. In a few moments, I had forced him back against the wall and he was in my power. Quickly, wildly, I put my sword's point again and again into his heart. At that moment, I heard that someone was trying to open the door. I hurried to close it firmly and then turned back to my dying enemy. But what human words can tell the surprise, the horror which filled me at the scene I then saw? The moment in which I had turned to close the door had been long enough, it seemed, for a great change to come at the far end of the room. A large mirror, a looking glass, or so it seemed to me, now stood where it had not been before. As I walked toward it in terror, I saw my own form, all spotted with blood, its face white, advancing to meet me with a weak and uncertain step. So it appeared, I say, but was not. It was my enemy. It was Wilson, who then stood before me in the pains of death. His mask and coat lay upon the floor. In his dress and in his face there was nothing which was not my own. It was Wilson, but now it was my own voice I heard as he said, I have lost. Yet from now on you are also dead. Dead to the world, dead to heaven, dead to hope. In me you lived, and in my death. See by this face which is your own, how wholly, how completely, you have killed yourself. I hope that everyone has had a pleasant evening, and that the preceding tale succeeded in its goal of making you compulsively look again at every person on the street who might look just a little bit like you. The Dread Familiar was created by Joel Hackett. William Wilson was written by Edgar Allan Poe. Don't forget to send me your stories and voices, submissions, at thedreadfamiliar.com. Thanks for listening. Good night.